my fundamental belief around team building, Robert, is very simple. Believe that human beings can be exceptional and then give them the opportunity to do so. To the person that says, I will go in and I will do everything for my business. Don't do this. Bring in an operator. Let them do this because it makes perfect sense to them and they would love nothing more than to build out a meeting agenda and then run it. Like we like that shit. We think it's fun. All right. What's up, everyone? I am super happy because today I'm with Jana, who is a magician when it comes to ops. Super happy because she's had the chance, number one, to be mentored directly by the Hormozis, collaborating with them on the specific company that she'll be explaining. Then also working directly with Cameron Harold, one of the legend CEO whisperer, you know, legendary ops leader. So currently collaborating with them directly directly and uh, you have a project together. So super excited to have you on, Jana. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Robert. I'm excited to be here. Yeah. So tell us a little bit, for those who don't know you, a little bit about your story and what got you initially into ops. Yeah, totally. So I like to say that before I found operations, I was quite literally directionless. I was living in a converted van, like van life full time. Uh, we were traveling all through North and South America, and I was just working a series of like odd remote jobs to make that happen. My boyfriend at the time was scaling a digital marketing agency. And so like two feet across the table every single day, I was watching him build this thing out, watching the problems and challenges he was facing. And, you know, as you do, you weigh in and you talk things through. And, and it became really clear to me over time that the things I was seeing in his business and the problems I was identifying were not on his radar. He was not seeing them at all. And that was so interesting to me, but whatever. A few months, you know, years honestly go by. And at some point through a series of odd events, I step into his business for what is supposed to be like 30 days, just cover for somebody who had just stepped out um, and eventually became that company COO. Because once I got inside, oh my gosh, to me, it was so obvious. There were just neon signs everywhere pointing towards gaps and inefficiencies and money and time that was just leaking out of the business. And again, he didn't see any of this. And so through, you know, mentors like Leila Hermosi and reading so many books and trying so many things in the business, I taught myself that that unique lens has a word, right? There's a skill set associated with that. There's a set of tools and knowledge associated with that. And that is what operations actually is. So I, I found my way into operations. I fell in love with it. I honed it as a skill set. I had the opportunity to join Joel Kaplan as his COO over at Agency Lab and his head operations coach for multiple years. And that was amazing because I got to pull back the curtain on literally hundreds of digital marketing agencies and see their problems at all stages of growth and gather so much data so quickly from that, that I eventually really came to hone in on what are the major operational bottlenecks and challenges that face digital marketing, like digital startups, I should say, at every stage of growth. And what are the major patterns to success to overcome those challenges and to scale successfully? So after enough time and with enough knowledge, I started my own business I, and that's now what I do. I help digital startup owners scale their companies and really scale themselves out of the day to day of the businesses as those businesses grow so that they can accomplish both the revenue and business targets, as well as the lifestyle targets that they set out for themselves when they first started the company. Wow, that's amazing. And you know, we know as agency owners how often we just start extinguishing fires all the time and we're caught up in the business. And uh, what's amazing about you is your tools and your resource resourcefulness and also just your insight. When I read um, what you post and everything and when we have a chance to chat, it's always like, oh, wow, this is just so clear. And I have been so oblivious of this. So, um, yeah, that's amazing. Before we dive in really into the nitty gritty, yes. um, I wanted to cover what did you specifically do with the Hermoses um, yeah. and, and to what extent were you uh, collaborating, being mentored by them specifically? Yeah. So back when uh, Alex was still CEO of Gym Launch, him and Layla launched a SaaS product called Allen, which was essentially one of the first AI like lead nurture bots out there. And they ran it with digital marketing agencies. And my agency at the time, this was the same one that I was COO of my very first kind of experience and foray into business. Um, we were one of the very first adopters of that software. And as part of his launch strategy, he was doing a lot of hands-on coaching with the early agency owners who were joining the software. So we had weekly group coaching calls with Alex Ramosi, and it was one of the most 
educational, certainly like, like amazingly valuable things in my life and really accelerated my learning curve. Um, and then I was able to work with Layla one-on-one for several months after that, just, she took a liking to me and was able to give me some direct ops mentorship, which again, just shortcutted so much learning that would have otherwise taken me a very long time to build the skills and the knowledge and the confidence that I was able to take into my roles. Wow. That's absolutely amazing. What would you say are the major takeaways you took from that? I think that Alex and Layla both are just like the most incredible critical thinkers when it comes to what really makes a business work or not work. I think as entrepreneurs in the weeds of our own business, we often get just so caught up in the little tactics and techniques and tips and tools and all these little hacks. And Alex really stands out to me as somebody who really understands the science of business and can take a step out of the weeds and not focus on any one strategy or tactic or you know sales hack, but is really just like, this is the best practices when it comes to playing the game of business. And he breaks it down, obviously, in his books and his content in the most simple terms. And Layla is very much the same, um, but her her unique genius is really on the people side, the operational side, the actual converting of Alex's vision into a reality is really her role in this whole thing. Um, so to see behind the curtain, I also learned a lot about their, their dynamics with each other, which is actually something I'm able to coach a lot of the visionaries and operators that I now work with on as a model, because it, they are, yin and yang they they told me that like alex is the gas pedal layla is the brake pedal right and i see that relationship emulated in so many visionary operator couples i work with and so to be able to coach them through the intrinsic dynamic and the tension within that dynamic and the like the give and take within that dynamic to create greatness i learned a lot just by watching how alex and layla work together wow that's amazing yeah. and if we want to dive in really into uh, the audience, you know, listening, they probably have a 100K a month uh, agency um, and they're they're facing problems, whether they're below that or above that. Sure. Um, what are the steps you've seen and the different bottlenecks overall that you've noticed for these kinds of digital startups, digital agencies? Oh, man, Robert, how much time we got? Yeah. Um, OK, so there's a couple of things like the really standout things that yeah. consistently either accelerate businesses through that critical stage of growth or absolutely stall them out and they cannot get past it. The first is uh, comes down to the personal evolution of the CEO founder, because when they were small and they were a solopreneur, they had a really small team. Success was all about how hard can they show up and work within the business and create new ideas and figure things out and just like get things done. Right. Success was all about them and their work ethic and their creativity. When you hit the 100K, like that seven figure run rate and above, success very rapidly starts to shift away from what you as an individual can do towards what your team as a collective can do. And your ability to succeed at that stage of growth comes down to, are you willing and able to evolve your own identity away from somebody who is personally competent and able to show up and get shit done towards somebody who is able to lead a team and build an ecosystem where shit gets done, but it doesn't necessarily get done by you. And I see so many business owners stall themselves out because they continue to show up in the day-to-day and do the things that made perfect sense for them to do when they were small because there was nobody else to do them. And now they are getting in their team's way. They are accidentally like disempowering their team and micromanaging their team and taking things off their team's plate because they are still operating under the assumption that if something needs to get done, I'm the best person to do it. As opposed to if something needs to get done, how do I create the ecosystem in which that gets done correctly, but not by me? And it's a totally, it's an identity shift, it's a behavior shift, it's a skill set and knowledge shift. And the CEOs who look at that and, and acknowledge that and like sign up to the challenge of that learning curve are able to get through it. The CEOs who continue to show up and run their businesses the way they did when they were small, stay small. And what's the major difference of someone who's running a a small business? You mentioned a few things, but on a systems level, like, and on a team's level and how, what's the difference if you're to bring us in a day to day from one, maybe seven figure growing versus one seven figure stalling? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I would say the biggest difference is uh, the flow of information actually. So at a systems level, when you're small, all of the information of how to run your business and how to do it well and what needs to happen every single day is pretty much just stuck in your brain. 
right? Like you are the SOPs and you are the project management system and you are the task delegation system and you are all of these things because it's just locked in your head because that totally works when you only have five clients and there's just not that much to manage. But as you scale up, the, the client volume is increasing. Just the sheer complexity creep of the business is exponentially compounding. There's so much more information to track down. There's so many more tasks to keep track of. There's so much more activity happening that again, for the, for the scalable versus not scalable systems, the scalable agency has taken all of that information out of people's brains and put it into a set of centralized systems and processes. And the systems become the safety net. The systems become the task management. The systems become that information hub, right? Versus the unscalable entrepreneur who doesn't want to focus on building those things out and doesn't know how. And like, again, I'll just keep going because this has always worked for me. Because all the information is in their brain, what happens is that they get sucked into the day to day and their team is coming to them for absolutely everything. And their team is asking them for every question and waiting on them to delegate every single task. And the owner gets really understandably frustrated by that situation, right? Like, why is my team showing up like this? And why can't they think for themselves? And why can't they just handle it without realizing that they haven't gone through the process of, de of centralizing all the information and depersonalizing it and taking it out of their brain so that their team can execute effectively without them. Um, and so it's, I understand why, because visionary CEOs hate operations, like, and I get it, like, it's not your highest skill set, it's not your highest value, your brain doesn't think in terms of systems, patterns, inefficiencies, gaps, right? That was in my very first partnership with my, you know, boyfriend, visionary CEO, he wasn't seeing any of the shit that I was seeing, because his brain worked in a fundamentally different way. But without me coming in to pull that out of him, and build the systems around him and build the processes that could run without him, he would have stayed as the single source of information and he would have stayed stuck as a result. Mm -hmm. It's funny you're seeing this and, you know, I've got some people in mind and I'm like, oh, okay, <laughs> that's exactly what's happening to them. And, you know, being pulled back in operations, yeah. uh, you know, being smoked out in some way, like burning out, being like, okay, I'm super tired. But it's yeah. like, okay, well, this is exactly the situation you're facing and yeah. this is what you got to do to solve it. So it's super interesting. You, you really put the, the, the nail on it. And it feels like, yeah. like your business starts to feel like an energetic black hole. Like what you'll notice if you're a founder being like, is this me? I don't know. You will show up every day and just be hyper reactive to the day-to-day -day needs of your business, client questions and team questions and fires and like start to end of your day is just spent like lobbing balls back and figuring things out and picking up balls and uncrossing wires. And you get to the end of the day and you're freaking exhausted and you haven't actually done anything that day that moves the business forward. You've only shown up to work in the business and to react to the business. And so it feels like all your proactivity and all the amazing ideas you have and all the offers you want to try, you're either like working yourself to death and fitting these things in before work or after work or on the weekends or your business is starting to slow down, if not stall out completely or roller coaster, because you can't show up and do the thing that you need to do, which is be the visionary CEO that drives the next wave of growth into your business. You are wearing every hat except for CEO and your business is suffering as a result. And how would you describe that role CEO in, in your mm -hmm. own words? Because, you know, a lot of people, you know, agency owners might say, oh, I'm the CEO, but like, uh, you know, when you really look at the tasks, you've probably have got a radically different definition than most of them. Yes, and and it is such a funny thing. I tell clients, I'm like, I give you the opportunity to learn how to be the CEO because up until working with me, you've spent 5%, maybe 10% of your working days as actually being the CEO of your business. And the other 90 to 95% of that time is spent being manager, media buyer, salesperson, account manager, like client fire putter outer, right? Like you're wearing every other hat except for the one that you actually want to be wearing. And that let's be honest, you don't actually know how to wear because your business hasn't given you the opportunity to just do that and just live in that zone of genius. So CEO to me, Robert, is very simply the person who sets the vision for the business, sets the strategy for how the business is going to accomplish that vision and then maintains the alignment of the entire team and the entire system and the entire company 
and keeps it in alignment with that strategy, right? Like if we're a ship at sea, you're the captain, you decide where we go and you chart the route on the map. And then you hold the wheel and make sure that we actually follow the chart, which sounds easy. It's really not. Um, but that is the job at the end of the day. That's the job. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because the CEO sometimes is really that, that PR person, right? That face of the business going on the podcasts, but a lot of people say I'm the CEO, but then as you mentioned, you know, extinguishing fires here and there, and it's really not that same reality. What would you say is the major transition point, let's say, for, for them to transition out of that role? What's the first step for them to, to say, okay, I'm not spending 5 to 10% of my time CEO, but 100%. It might be scary, but what do I need to do to get there? Yeah, that's such a great question. Operations is the make or break at that point. I'm absolutely convinced of this. You cannot be the true and only CEO of your business if you don't have a scalable foundation where the business can run the day to day without you, because otherwise you're the scalable foundation and the business will run, but only so long as you are trapped in the weeds. Right. So does your team have like, is your high performance team? First off, that's a big one. Do you have a high performance team? Do you know how to find those people and do you know how to manage them so that they bring their best to the table? Absolutely critical leadership skill that most startup entrepreneurs have never developed and they need to learn as they go. Do you have systems and systems infrastructure and processes that will scale and keep balls from being dropped and keep wires from being crossed and keep the day-to-day of the business operating efficiently? Not your job, by the way, visionary CEOs, not your job. That's your operator's job, right? But do you have that person who is then able to turn around and build those things for you, right? So do you have the right people in place? Are they supported and backed by the right systems? And then the final thing you asked, you know, what really trips CEOs up at this stage of growth? The other thing is, Do you have a clear um, and consistent strategic vision? Most CEOs, when they start, are like hyper squirrel syndrome because you can be and because you should be like, try all the offers, launch all the products, try and work with all the clients, like do that because you don't know what the heck it is you're doing. And it is only through that trial and error that you're ever going to figure it out. But when you hit 100K per month, it that same hyper agile reactivity that every idea I have is a good idea and it's worth testing starts massively and catastrophically whiplashing your business because now you're asking a team of five people, a team of 10 people to pivot and pivot and pivot every other week. And the whiplash that that creates for them is demotivating. It totally erodes trust and it makes it so that your team can do nothing other than sit around and react and wait for the next brilliant idea that you bring in two weeks later. And so that's the final thing I would say CEOs, as far as a personal evolution, really need to recognize is that at the start, success was about saying yes to everything. As you scale, success becomes about saying no way more often than you say yes. And CEOs have to develop the self-discipline as well as be willing to put, again, operator's job, put the infrastructure and the team around themselves so that they hear no. And that they don't get to do everything that they want to do, but they get to do the most important things that will really drive the business forward. Mm -hmm. That was a bit of a rant. Did I answer your question? Yeah, that's amazing. So many golden nuggets in there. And, you know, I'm just thinking about the same people again, and I can see that clear transition. Um, I've got a question for you, though, because you said it's all about the high performance team and finding the right people. And it seems like you definitely got a flair for this with your experience. And I feel maybe a lot of CEOs, I've been in positions where, you know, I'm trying to hire for this position. I maybe don't have the acuity to really spot those kinds of people. So what would you say really defines those kinds of special ops people? Yeah, it's a great question. So putting into two buckets, how do I find my operator? And then how do I find a high performance team? Um, My highest recommendation is let your operator find your highest performance team. Because the reality is, is that like hiring and managing A players is not a game of intuitive guesswork. It's not a, you know, crapshoot and I hope I hit an A player and I hope that they stay with me for a long time. There is a set of systems and processes and best practices that will statistically guarantee that you find the right people, you bring them into the right role, you give them the right training and you set them up for maximum success. There is a way to do that. And most CEOs that I know are just like, I hired my brother's cousin's 
girlfriend because she was available. And then I just threw her in the deep end and she's doing great, right? That's not going to scale. <laughs> so it's not your, again, it's not your highest value to acquire all of the knowledge around how to systematically build a high performance team. Your operator should do that. Therefore, the only person that you need to know how to find is your operator, which brings us to the second point of like, do I have an operator? What should I be looking for in this person? And how do I make sure that they can do all of the things that Jonna says they should be able to? So is that where we go next? Yep. Okay. So guys, when I, there was, when I was first getting started before I would put a client's operator in my coaching program, cause that's what I do. I have coaching programs for operators to level them up so that they can turn around and implement all of this within your business. Before I would do that, I would sit down with every single operator and I would interview them personally. And 20 to 30% of the time, I would tell the visionary that they should not put that operator in the coaching program because they didn't have the right DNA. Back to my, like how I got started in all of this, right? When I stepped into that first business, I didn't know what the heck I was doing. I didn't know anything about business. I didn't even know what operations was. And yet everywhere I looked, there were giant neon signs saying, hey, problem, gap, inefficiency this way. Every operator that I've met has that lens. They may have no skills, no experience, no knowledge, but they have the underlying lens that how they see your business is through the lens of systems and gaps and patterns and inefficiencies. And so this could be an account manager. This could be an executive assistant. This could be a sales guy. Like honestly, amazing operators exist everywhere. Do they have the right underlying lens? If so, then with the right training and knowledge and skills, they can up level and become an amazing operator without that lens. And this is the 20 to 30% of people I'd be like, Hey, you put this person in the operations role, but they're not a good operator and you should move them out of this role and find somebody else. Um, and so that, that kind of operator DNA skin is still something that we do for our clients just to make sure that they aren't investing into somebody who is not naturally gifted when it comes to filling the role. That's amazing. The DNA part and I'm, now that you explain it, I can see it so clearly. Um, yeah, you have an operator. Yeah, exactly. And it's really, it's really all about seeing those gaps and, and in some ways seeing the nitty gritty details that maybe the CEO or the visionary is too focused on the future and might not be seen. And now I understand when you say, you know, Layla is the, the brake and Alex is the gas pedal. Correct. So you totally need both to drive the car safely. And I would also say that many visionaries, even if they have a super talented operator, they don't like working with them because the operator is the brake pedal. The operator is the person to say, well, have you actually thought that through? Well, how are we going to do that? With what resources, with what bandwidth, with what time, right? They're the person that whose job it is, is to take your vision and make it a reality. So they're the realist saying, you know, I actually don't think that's realistic. And that's really hard for an entrepreneur who's never worked with a gas pedal and sees it as something that is slowing them down as opposed to like, what's that uh, like weightlifting term? Like, slow is smooth and smooth is fast. Like that's the job of the operator. Yes, we may incrementally slow things down, but only so we can make things frictionless so that they can speed way the hell up. But entrepreneurs have to be willing to go through the initial slowdown and listen to the brake pedal. And they also have to be able to trust that the brake pedal knows when to pump the brakes and that they aren't doing that aggressively or more often than is needed. Mm -hmm. Wow. And so assuming you find them, where do you find these operators? I mean, do you just hire them off anywhere? Or is there like a specific, I, I guess you coach people on this specifically, but yeah. you have to poach them. Um, where do you find the best one usually? So it depends on the level of operator that you need to hire. And I have a whole free masterclass on this. And if anybody follows me on Facebook, DM me and I will direct you to that training. Um, depends on the level of operator you need to hire, but pretty much you have some money and you have some time. And the more that you have of one, the less you need of the other. Meaning if you have a bunch of time and no money, you're a small agency, you have all the time in the world, but you don't have any budget to hire someone. Then my highest recommendation would be that you find a ops manager with high potential and no direct experience because that person will be very cheap. And then you invest in training them up and coaching them up, right? That's going to give you the most bang for your buck. If you have the reverse of like, wow, I am drowning in bottlenecks and inefficiencies. I have all this money and I have absolutely no time to fix this. Then hire the, the experienced, expensive head of operations that can come in, batteries included, and solve all of these problems because they've been there and they've done that and they know exactly what needs to get done, right? Most clients I work with, Robert, are somewhere in the middle of I have who I think it might be an operator. 
They've demonstrated some skill and some ability. They have no formal training, but I want to take a chance on them because I really trust them. And I really believe in them. And for those people, yeah, plug them into the coaching program, get them leveled up and trained up so that you don't have to incur a new salary, but you're still able to receive all of the benefit of having a highly skilled operator on your team. And that makes me think about the post that you uh, you made recently on the VAs, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I really like that post. And essentially, um, if you want to explain it a, a little bit, like your your perspective on VAs and um, your perspective on teams as well, like long term teams and yeah. potentially uh, helping people level up within your ecosystem. Yeah. So a little anecdote here. I will never forget this. I hopped on a consulting call with a client, and he was so burnt out and so frustrated by his team. And he said, it feels like they're a bunch of five-year-olds and I'm a kindergarten teacher. And I just reflected back to him. I was like, dude, if you're showing up every single day and treating your team like five-year-olds, then they're going to show up as five-year-olds. My, my fundamental belief around team building, Robert, is very simple, which is that believe that human beings can be exceptional and then give them the opportunity to do so and believe that they will be exceptional until they prove you wrong, not the other way around. And so when it comes to, for example, VAs, hate the word VA because I think it brings with it all of these connotations that this person is stupid or incompetent or needs to be micromanaged, or I can't possibly hire a VA until I have a library of SOPs that dummy proofs their role versus you're hiring a full fucking human being with all the creativity and all the potential work ethic and all the potential to be exceptional. But are you giving them the chance to bring that to the table? Or are you taking that opportunity away off the bat with how you think about them, how you treat them, or how you manage them? And so if we're really talking about what makes a high performance team, a high performance team is one in which everyone is expected, like minimum acceptable standard is that you are damn good because you are. And that's where we set the expectation. And I'm not going to baby you and I'm not going to micromanage you and I'm not going to coddle you. Show up and bring your best to the table. And then people do. It's the wildest thing. Um, So again, not to get too big of a rant on this, but when it comes to identifying your operator, we've had so many operators go through my coaching programs that started as VAs in the business, or they started as like international executive assistants, right? They started as these total entry level roles, but again, they modeled the right behavior. They were coming to their visionary and saying, hey, I'm seeing gaps here, or hey, I took a stab at building a system around this because I saw this and I thought it could be better, right? If you're seeing that from any member of your team, that's an indicator that they may have that operator DNA. And if you are in need of an operator, I would look there first because it doesn't matter where they're from and it doesn't matter how much you pay them and it doesn't matter what their job title is. If they have the operator DNA and you're willing to invest in their coaching, they could be exceptional. Mm Mm-hmm. And tell us a little bit about, as well, now that we have remote teams and everything, you have a a bit of a controversial view on um, working part-time and that kind of stuff. Tell us a little bit more about how you view that now that we all have remote teams. I believe that, again, the the nature of high-performance teams is that they manage based off of outcomes, not inputs. Meaning, for like, let me take my team as an example. I don't care how much my team works. My head of operations told me that she got a side hustle. Cool. I learned recently that my ops manager takes a nap in the middle of the day. Beautiful. I really couldn't care less. Couldn't care less because is the deliverable being met? Are they performing at an excellent and exceptional level, meeting the expectations of the role and absolutely delivering? So long as the answer is yes, do I care that she takes a nap in the middle of the day? Not if that's what like re-energizes her and allows her to like, and then she works late. She works until like 8 p.m. If it that is her reset that allows her to come back to the table, re-energized and ready to go, hell yeah, right? So we live in a world where people are quiet quitting, getting side hustles, using AI and delegating out half their work and not telling you. These things are happening whether you like it or not. As a business owner, we have no control over this. So the question is, do your management strategies and systems punish them for that and make them feel like they have to hide it from you or feel like they have to be like skirt around it somehow? Or do we shift to manage towards what actually matters, which is, are you getting the job done? And do I care that AI is doing half the work? I really don't. I really don't. The, de- the deliverable is met, right? 
Do I care that you work in the Philippines and that you're, you know, you work weird hours so that you can homeschool your kid? No, I think that's amazing. And I, in fact, think that because my business offers you the flexibility to do that, you are more likely to show up and work harder for me and stay longer with me because I offer you that ability, right? So how do we take what most companies right now are getting buried by, like people are quitting left and right, productivity is through the floor right now. And how do you swap, like turn that into a competitive advantage? It comes down to how are you going to show up and manage your team? Wow. And I previously saw you speak about how you also organize your week um, mm -hmm. to minimize meetings, especially. And Cameron also has a book on this. Yeah. Um, what was the title of the book? I think it's meetings. Is it meetings suck? Meetings suck, I think. Yeah. <laughs> and you, you were also speaking briefly about this, but I think a lot of business owners, especially if they have remote workers in the Philippines and everything, it's like, oh man, I've got to coordinate all these time zones all the time. How do you organize the week um, your week and, and how do you advise others build their week so that they're very efficient in their meetings? Yeah. So there's two pieces to this. The, the tactical answer is that I carve out a four hour window of time, four days a week, and that is spyglass hours. So the expectation is that regardless of time zone, and this applies to me as well, right? Like if I decide to travel to Bali, I have to honor spyglass hours, which is nine to one mountain standard time, Monday through Thursday. If the team is going to talk, that's when we talk. If a meeting is going to be scheduled, that's when it will be scheduled for. If Slack is going to go off, that's when Slack is busy. That is the time that all of us have agreed and I hire and fire based off of whether people can make this work for their schedules. This is the time. Just be available. Be online, right? Sometimes there won't be meetings. Sometimes nothing needs to happen. But this is when we've all agreed to line up so that the talking can happen. The alternative to that that I see most companies do is that they either do like nine to five and then the same amount of talking gets done. It just takes twice as long or they have like this 24 hour communication cycle where everything takes like a full day to get back to you. And so everything is really, really slow because people are chiming in and like these conversations are stretching out over days. Right. So my biggest best practice when it comes to meetings and communication, guys, is have meetings. And I know that that feels counterintuitive because don't meetings suck and don't we want, not want those. Meetings are so much more efficient and effective than trying to have all of that communication happening in Slack or random last minute calls or whatever, blowing up your team's computers in your computer every day, distracting you, pulling you out of your most important work, interrupting your flow. That is so much more expensive than just having a 20 minute huddle, right? So have meetings, make them good, make them effective, make them efficient, say what needs to be said. And then I ran the numbers on this, Robert. Last year, my team averaged 11 messages per person per working day. That was how much we needed to talk. And these included messages being like, K, okay, right? Like 11 messages per person per day, that's what needed to be sent outside of meetings. That was all the communication that needed to happen. Versus when I look at my clients average, we do audits and we go in and do an audit. It is like 50, 80, 100 messages getting sent over the course of the day. Everyone is constantly in their Slack, constantly on their phones. They're not, they're so busy talking that they have no time to execute and do their job. Versus having a 20 minute huddle that takes all of that talking and puts it in 20 minutes. Yeah, you're going to see massive efficiency gains there. And how do you transfer that from like having tons of communication to having short huddles and probably into processes as well and, and you know tasks how do you suggest people transition to something that's much more effective yes great question again my giant permission slip to you and to your listeners is that this is not your job to the person that says i will go in and i will do everything for my business don't do this bring in an operator let them do this because it makes perfect sense to them and they would love nothing more than to build out a meeting agenda and then run it like we like that shit we think it's fun right so my my highest recommendation is number one you need to have systems where information is centralized the system that i use i call it the single source of truth it's essentially a project management system asana or clickup or monday.com you need to have one place where all of the information that your team needs to execute the day-to-day -day of their job can be found is searchable and is centralized. Just having that 
is going to eliminate 50% of the communication that's currently happening. Because if you really look at the communication in your business, half of it is just trying to figure out what the heck is going on. Where are we at with this client? And did you finish that? And is that client in Colorado? And do you have their number? And what was the payment plan we agreed to, right? Like it's literally just trying to figure stuff out. To have a single system where that information is organized and found at the click of a button automates and eliminates all that communication. Just doesn't need to happen anymore. So that when we hop on a meeting, all we're talking about is clarifying like, hey, you assigned this one task to me, but I didn't quite understand it. And I have a follow up question. Beautiful problem solving, like guys, I'm stuck and I really don't know what to do. So can we get some creative brainstorming on this? Right. That's pretty much it. And like setting priorities. Hey, what's everybody working on? Just so that we know. That is all I talk about in my meetings. It takes a couple hours a week to just say that because nothing else needs to be said outside of those meetings. Everybody knows their job. Everybody knows where to find the information they need to do their job. Balls don't get dropped. Wires don't get crossed. So what is there to talk about? Wow. That it seems so simple and so logical, but yet again, if you look at most agency owners, it's absolutely the opposite. So yeah. very important reminder. <laughs> and again, I can't emphasize enough like that chaos guys that you're living in right now. It is optional. It doesn't have to be that way, but you are not the best person to fix that problem right? How operations really drives growth to your business is that when your operator can come in, quiet the chaos, shut your slack off, give you hours a day. Like I have hours a day to just work on my business, right? All the things that you are able to now get done, all of the ideas you get to implement and the strategic partnerships you need to, you get to go out and find and nurture and all the knowledge that you like gain because you have time to learn it. That's how operations drives growth to your business, because otherwise you wouldn't have the time to do any of that. You would be stuck in the weeds, right? And so I think a lot of people hold off on hiring an operator or investing because they don't understand the ROI. What is the ROI of having a project management system? What is the ROI of reorganizing my Slack, right? I don't understand how these things connect to the money pipeline. And that's totally fair. It's a hard distinction to make, but the reality is, is how much of your day are you wasting? doing things that you wouldn't otherwise have to be doing client fires that wouldn't exist and team members that wouldn't quit and questions that wouldn't come your way. How much time is that taking up? And what is the opportunity cost you're incurring right this second? Because all of that time is being spent in the ways of your business, as opposed to working on your business and driving it forward. That's the ROI of bringing in an operator and letting them do their best work. Yeah. And I feel a lot of um, CEOs maybe have a, a tough time evaluating, you know, opportunity cost or you know that that sunk cost that doesn't appear so clear it's not like okay i've got facebook ads running um yes. you know yeah. it's easy to measure but it's so important and once you get out of the weeds and you start working on higher leverage tasks and higher leverage tasks that's where the real growth happens if it's well done yep, exactly. um wanted to ask you do you have a, a client story that you've done recently that you can share how you've helped them improve ops and um how you've helped them scale improving their ops. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll share, um, I just hopped off her operator's graduation call. Like her operator just finished my coaching program and we went through the whole process together. And she said a couple of things. Number one, that compared to the business that she had before and the business that she has today, we worked together for about eight months. She literally can't even believe that they were able to make that big of a transformation. Because when I met her, she was, all the things we've been talking about, absolutely in the weeds of the business. Her team was coming to her for everything. Every fire that happened, she personally had to see through and like put out. And she was just like perpetually underwhelmed. Like her team was just underperforming a little bit all the time. Like things were okay, but God, I wish they were better. And like, God, I wish I could move faster. And God, I don't know where all of the hours in my day are going. And I'm just frustrated and I'm slowly getting burnt out by this situation because my growth has started to slow down. I feel like I'm getting like just sucked into the day-to-day -day of my business and I don't know how to get out of this situation. We took her operator. This girl had no direct operations experience. She, this was her first job. She had no business experience, right? So like totally raw and green, put her through all of my training programs. And when I hopped on with that same visionary, now that her operator's graduated, she's like, my org chart literally looks like me at the top and then my operator and then everyone else. My operator runs the entire show. She handles all of the day-to-day. -day. She now manages my other managers and leads them through. They actually like use my trainings and she like coaches the other managers on leadership best practices. 
handles all the escalations. The team has never been performing better. They got all the underperformers off the bus. And the visionary is now being like, yeah, John, I'm starting my second venture because I have all this time on my hands. Like I just have so much time that I can't sit still and I'm ready to start my next thing. And so I think I'm going to go become a coach. Right. And so as well as just like the ease, the lack of stress, the, la- the amount of presence that she had, like her whole life and the lived experience of running her business have been fundamentally transformed. And what I think is beautiful about the work that we do, Robert, is that I met with her once a month. That transformation happened and it didn't require any input from her. It took no time. It took no energy. All it took was delegating, trusting, and allowing this operator to do her best work. And the operator was able to make everything else transform. Wow. That's absolutely amazing. (laughs) Sounds like the best business move ever, yet very few people actually see that. And they they look at all these shiny objects instead. Yep. But it's the fundamentals. Um, So, Jana, we're coming back to the uh, top of the hour. Mm. And I wanted to discuss with you, you have something special for our audience. Yeah. So I'm very excited about this because I've been trying to figure out a way of, of giving this to people for free for a long time. We've essentially created a very short survey, 25 questions. We ask you 25 questions about your business. You answer honestly. And we have built the back end scoring of this so that it will spit out what your number one biggest ops bottleneck is. So you answer 25 questions. We will tell you what the number one thing is that you need to immediately fix and improve to unlock the highest level of growth and scalability in your business. So that is what it's a free survey. We're about to launch it. Um, and it's, it's there for people to help identify again, because visionaries don't have the lens that says, here's the neon sign check here. We have created the survey that will at least point you in the right direction so that you know where to look. Perfect. We'll put the link down below for that. And um, wanted to ask you one last question. If you, if you see any digital business owner or a digital agency owner, um, what would be the number one piece of advice you would want to leave them with? I think it would be that you are your company's biggest and best asset. You are the, your company's most valuable resource, your time, your energy, your creativity, your work ethic. You are the thing to be protected and optimized within your own business. The more you can show up and live in your zone of genius and do your highest value work and do the things that light you up and make you happy, the more your company will grow. It is the single highest thing you can invest in to allow your company to get outsized results. So where you find yourself, burnt out, frustrated, doing things you hate, doing things that you know are low value, doing things that you know are outside of your zone of genius. My reframe for you is that those things aren't frustrating. They're not annoying. They're not a problem to outwork or outgrind. They are expensive. They are costing your business money because your time and energy is not being allocated the things that will drive your company forward. That's a problem. Don't outwork the problem, work smarter. Get the problem off your plate so that you can turn around and do the things that you do best and your company will thank you for it. Perfect. Wonderful close. I'm so glad we had this episode together, Jana, and uh, it's been wonderful having you. I mean, there are probably a million golden nuggets in here that we'll have to dig out for content. So um, very grateful for the episode. Absolutely. And guys, grab the freebie. I hope it's helpful. And if this was helpful, I would also say, check me out on Facebook. I do live weekly masterclasses. I post content. Like my mission is really to just get this information out there so that CEOs stop making it so damn hard on themselves. And so happy to offer as much free value as I can. What's the name of your Facebook group? So everyone knows. Yeah. Spyglass ops is the Facebook group. You can follow me on Facebook, John Lee, and uh, we'll, we'll get you set up with everything that you need to not again, outwork the problem, but to circumvent the problem entirely. Outsmarted. Thanks a lot, Jenna. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Robert.